platforms. So, okay. All right. All right. It should be, it looks like it's working now. All right. Hey, everybody. This is the People's Podcast. I'm uh, Nick Branham, the national chair of the People's Party, one of your hosts. And I'm here with uh, Karen Robos and Buzzy. Um, you guys want to say hi? Karen? Sure. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, my name is Karen. I'm in Massachusetts. Um, I'm on the central committee of the party, um, and I'm really excited to be back on another episode of the podcast. So thank you for having me. Um, and I guess that's all. Cool. Buzzy? Yeah, um, Buzzy up in here in uh, Agunquit, Maine, and um, just uh, one of the maniacs pushing for the People's Party. Um, that's it, E. E or uh, Arabos, I'm in West Harlem, New York City. Uh, New, York, New York City. Um, <laughs> pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, I totally uh, am part of the people's part. Sweet. And uh, E, I think there's a little bit of like audio issue. I don't know if you can come a little closer or. Or, or something like that, or you know, do something with the audio. But if you can make it a little better, that'd probably be that probably help people. But okay, yeah, hey all. So today we got uh, we got some super interesting topics uh, that I know have been uh, have been really uh, hot and discussed um, around uh, left circles recently. And so we're talking about patriotic socialism, economic populism, and uniting the left and the right against the establishment. And so. You know, particularly our philosophy, the People's Party philosophy, about how it is that you do that. Um, so the first thing, uh, the, something that came to our attention was this great video uh, that Jimmy Dore featured, um, and I think it was uh, it was shared by uh, by Jay Buffon of RBN, and it's this awesome video of a guy who's a communist talking to a like Trump supporter. And like, you know, the, the, the biggest of Trump supporters, you know, somebody who believes that Trump won about how exactly, you know, and, and really building solidarity with that person and the way that they do it is amazing. You know, the way that they actually manage to find common ground. So I'm going to screen share. I'm going to uh, bring that up. And then we can watch that. All right, here we go. All right. So this is about seven minutes. We'll watch about half of it. We'll comment and then we'll watch about the rest of it. This is pretty interesting. We've talked about that people need to organize along class lines and forget it's not a left or right issue anymore. It is not lefties against righties. It isn't even though everybody at the corporate media like the Young Turks, the Intercept, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, they all want you to think these are left-right issues. They're not. Ending the war, not a left-right issue. Uh, living wage, not a left-right issue. Health care, not a left-right issue. Wall Street, not a censorship. All these are not left-right issues. These are us against them. And that's what they're afraid of realizing. So when you go to a live Jimmy Dore show, what's happening in that room is what scares the shit out of the establishment. <laughs> people on the left, people on the right, people in the middle, black, white, old, young, religious, atheists, all coming together to realize we have a common enemy. And that uh, enemy is the oligarchy that did a controlled demolition of our economy over the last two years while enriching them and having us hate each other over a vaccine that didn't work this way they said it did. Okay, I just got to say, that is so true, because I've been to uh, a few Jimmy Dore shows, and his shows are an amazing, like, just confluence of working people, like, all ages, all races, all backgrounds, you know, like, coming together. It's so clear. It's like, nowhere else do you see such a coming together of people from different ideological perspectives, too. Like, you could tell there are people who are, you know, socialists, communists, leftists, all the way with people who are, you know, Trump supporters. And that is amazing about his shows. I wanted to say that. And I'm not going to do that. And so guess what? Somebody went and talked to a Trumper, a socialist communist went and talked to a Trumper and friend of the show, Jay from the uh, Revolutionary Blackout Network, he said, proof that when you talk about issues from a layman's perspective, 
people will agree with you, even even if even if they claim to be conservative, because it's a class issue. Many of us should take a lesson from this, thanks to SLC Socialists for showing me this. So let, let's watch this. So here's a guy who's a socialist going to talk to a Trumper conservative and watch how he doesn't hate him. Watch how he finds ways that they're alike, that they can work together on in agreement. And this is what scares the shit out of them. And you watch how they're trying to shit on this because of it. Wow. That's like when I interviewed a Boogaloo boy. It, they all freaked out. We can't be, we can't. Yes, we can. And watch this. In order to stop the communist agenda, we need to get rid of the big banks. Right. Uh, Karl Marx, um, no one knew who he was until the big banks so distributed right. all of his literature. Right, right. And so in order to get rid of communism, we need to get rid of the big banks. Yeah. Uh, get rid of big pharma. Right. Um, what else? Big tech. Big tech. Right. Uh, um, yeah, and it's like... So this guy, he gets that there are a handful of oligarchs that have way too much control and power in our culture and society. They get that. Okay. Just like we do. Land, land, like these like landlords that like are coming in and buying like hundreds of properties. You don't even know where right, like, like China is doing it, Bill Gates. And Zillow. Yeah. I feel like a So he gets that. Mm -hmm. He get he's not a complete free market guy. No, that's just, uh, he gets that there's nefarious, powerful, well-moneyed forces that are wrecking our home market in the United States, and we should do something about it. We do too. The people here are very fed up and they're ready to collectivize and sort of seize the means of production. So he's saying to this guy, a Marxist idea, that the workers should seize the means of production. Workers at companies and corporations Instead of just being hourly employees, they should actually own the business. So they have now owned this, the means of production. And it's not owned by one capitalist oligarch who can pick up his company and move it to another country, devastating the city it was in, and then exploiting even more desperate people in another desperate situation, like, say, in Mexico or Thailand or wherever, Bangladesh. And so he's saying, well, shouldn't the workers collectivize and then own the company? Watch what this guy says back. Which is this, by the way, that's what Dr. Richard Wolf says on this show all the time. What's what he says? Yeah, right. I mean, that's why I support says, unions yes. so much. You know, well, you wanna... I, I we... so this guy says that's why I support unions. And you could see he's the ah, unions. Mm. I've always had a, a reflex to not like unions, but watch what he does say. It's funny. I, I work, I, I work for a, actually, not this shirt, the other shirt I had an earlier for a company not too far from here called Liberty Pump, non union. They let the company, the owners of the company sold the a third of the company to the employees. So the employees have ownership of it. That's exactly what that what Mark says. The work, so he's saying that's a great thing. He goes, I worked for this company, the some pump company. It's a non-union company. People love the company, and the owners sold a third of the company to them. So now they're owners in it. So now they get a decision making role at the company, the workers. And he sees that as a positive. Now, most right winger, most people, corporate, corporate Democrats, Republicans, all of them, establishment will tell you that's horrible. That's communism. He's saying, no, that's empowering the workers. That's what this Trumper is saying to a communist. They're agreeing. And if you don't think this makes the establishment shit their pants, you've been watching too much corporate news because it does. Here we go just a lot better oh, yeah. and well they're collectivized so it's a lot better he's saying now the ownership of the company is in the hands of the workers which is a lot better let me back it up <laughs> yeah right i mean that's why i support unions so much you know, well i i it's funny. I, I work. I, I work for a actually not this shirt. The other shirt I had an earlier for a company not too far from here called Liberty Pump, non-union. They let the company, the owners of the company, sold the co a third of the company to the employees. So the employees have ownership of it, which is a lot better. Oh, yeah. and well, they're collectivizing. Right. It's, cooperative. A, it's an ESOP. Yeah, the workers own. It's an the, ESOP. Yeah. It's an ESOP. I never heard that term before. Can you look it up? Yeah. ESOP. What that means? So that that is amazing. That is amazing to see that kind of agreement 
I'm just going to, I'm going to turn off the screen sharing for a minute. Um, between someone on the left and the right. And it's like, you know, how was that done? You know, the first thing that I think is that now, I mean, the right wing, which has been taught, you know, that uh, uh, capitalism is, you know, uh, going to provide a bountiful existence. Anybody can make it in this system. That kind of mythology is falling apart, I think, on the right, as it already has on the left. Like, for example, they've seen the right has seen the way that big tech has censored them just like the left off their platforms. They've seen the way that big pharma has pushed, you know, vaccine mandates for vaccines that have, you know, all kinds of side effects and that were incredibly unnecessary and that are used to justify all kinds of authoritarian state measures. And so the right wing, I think, you know, is waking up to this idea and the left that it's the corporate state that is the problem. Like Ralph Nader said, 10 years ago in his book, you know, again, it unstoppable, the emerging alliance between the left and the right coming together to smash the corporate state. Can I jump in for one second? Yeah, totally. So it, I love this video. Um, and <laughs> what I love about it is it, it basically, um, it shatters the, the narrative, right? Also, I think we really have to kind of start um, putting left and right, like in quotes, because what that means um, and the realignment that we're seeing is changing um, pretty much by the day. And as you have both the left and the right coming to this more um, uh, populist kind of perspective around economics, um, then the only way that they have left to differentiate the left and the right is through the social and the cultural. So then it's like, okay, we're going to reframe politics. We're going to reframe everything to be seen through a, a cultural perspective, a gender perspective, a racial perspective, a social perspective, because that's the only thing we have. Because once these, these two uh, sides, right, realize that they have so much overlap and and completely shared class and economic interests it's over if you don't separate us on something then they have nothing nothing left the other thing i just want to point out that i think is really important with this video is that the way he approached this guy right there was no moral superiority or moral yes. purity or like this is a horrible deplorable that I have to school and I have to teach him and he's got to come to the correct way of thinking. Right. You know, that that's not how you reach people. So it's brilliant. Yeah, it wasn't like a lecture. No. Yeah. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, you're I coming across great. Stuff. Yeah, this is my first thing here. Um, uh, to Jimmy's credit, again, I think it was last year or earlier in this year. It was, I think it was last year. He showed a video um, about the Black Panthers in Chicago. Uh, I don't know if they did it in any, in any other city, but in Chicago, he showed the Black Panthers in a unity movement. They used to do unity coalitions with some uh, Ku Klux Klan youth that moved up from down south into Chicago and into Detroit. And because he approached them from the standpoint of saying, you know, you're poor, just like we're poor, right? You may be white and you have some white skin privilege and all of that, but you live in poor, you live in low income housing, right? You're on welfare, you know, if you, you, you don't get a welfare check, you're probably gonna commit a crime just so you can get something to eat to feed your family. And when he when when they were approached like that, they did a unit they did a unity forum. And in the background of the picture, you can see uh, the symbols, right? Like the black the Black Panther, and you could see the KKK symbol, or uh, the Don't Threat on Me, and the other one. And and they sat there and had public forums, right? Like town halls, and people could approach them. And over the fullness of time. Uh, many many of these uh, Ku Klux Klaners or Ku Klux Klan siblings, neo-Nazis, whatever they were, they, they gave that up, 
right? They surrendered that they, because that was their form of an identity politics as this has much more lethality. It's much more lethal to be sure, but that's their, that was their form of an identity, right? And that's, that's what they had. And, and over the fullness of time, they gave that up. And he also showed um, a different video with uh, Daryl, what's his name? This uh, black guy, musician, uh, promoter, he was going to Klan rallies. A black guy standing there, black as all day, in a tight ass ponytail, going in the middle, you know, of, of a Klan rally, and and interacting with the leaders, interacting with the people, and so much so, they got to saw his saw his humanity, and and saw that they had very similar struggles as working class people, and many of like even Grand Dragons, right? They gave up their hoods and and their and their armaments and their different symbols and things like that i gave it to him and he brings it on as part of his presentation and outreach to people so the the point of that is you know if if no one if, if someone is just hitting you with a stick and telling you how bad you are right that, that's all you're going to understand right that's what you're going to react to oh here comes the stick right but if you 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 approach people and say no i'm not gonna not interested in using the stick because i've been getting my ass beat for that same stick it's just in another side of the country. And I come in and I come in, yeah, I offer you food, offer you a job, offer you, you know, whatever it is, supportive services. And I offer this to you. You start to see the human side of people. They start to show you their humanity if you show them your humanity. And that's what I'm getting out of this. And that's that's, that's what we need to be. Yep. You know, I just think when we, I, I appreciate e, what you said there 100%, you too, Karen. Um, just when you see Jimmy present these two gentlemen speak to each other, it's how we have to speak to each other because we all know you speak to someone and first of all, most people don't want to talk about politics because they've been exasperated. They are just tuned out and they are so triggered by it. And you have to blow past that it, 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 for some people. You don't have to. Some people don't want to talk to you to give them their space. If you other people you talk to, it's just they're red or uh, blue and that's it. And, and they're just so wound up into that paradigm that you can't even – shake them and the best way to piss them off is just say you're the same and, and that triggers them up like a few things but the, the bring these people together so they can um find like all the commonality we have is 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 what is like you said is scaring people and it's there talk to people outside i live in a very affluent tourist community if i talk to every once in a while you hear these people thinking they're confused what's going on with this world why is things going sideways i mean you made your bed and lied in it this is a capitalist society collapsing in front of us we see it, and now we need to start tying capitalism um, in, in into what's going on. Like, there's no water in Mississippi. That's the Mississippi Water Department. That's the capitalistic Mississippi Water Department. We need to start tying these names to things, particularly that. I don't want to get too far off target. And, and to point these problems out that we as humans, we as people are suffering through the structures of our, our government. And if we can see how we can change these structures or take all common – listen – Red, blue, everyone in Mississippi needs water. It doesn't matter what your political orientation is there. You all need water. So we have to have solidarity to the water needers. And if we come together yeah. and start letting us, these individual, the minor differences of whatever that statement is, I don't want to, that quote, don't don't get us straight. Come together and just keep believing it. And we're going to bring people into this thing because it's, it's there. And people want solidarity. People want someone else to, like, uh, empathize with their plight because they're feeling it too. And now people don't want to talk about it. The world's very scary right now, and people are um, really, really just anxious about things. So, back to you, Nick. I, and and that's why another reason Jimmy is so deadly to the to the establishment because he doesn't. He's going to show these things, and he knows this triggers him because when he did the boogaboo things, he got so much blowback coming left, right. But he knew where it really came from. The fact you're bringing this guy who everyone's right. supposed to hate, and us people who are supposed to be leftists, and like now all of a sudden Jimmy's a righty. And anyways, back to you, Nick. No, you're you're so right because you know that is why I think even so much of the left, but especially liberals, hate Jimmy, is because he reaches out to the left and the right and is able to bring people together around those you know economic populist issues. You know, and I think that um, you know as uh, like in, in in speaking with him recently, like I realized that the that the liberals and even some leftists hate him. Because not of what he stands for, you know, not because he stands for all the right things. He stands for, you know, universal health care and, 
you know, ending all the wars and mass surveillance and every, you know, everything that we stand for every, you know, on, on, on the left, but it's not that it's his aesthetic. It's the same reason that the liberals don't like Trump, you know, not necessarily because Trump is meaningfully different in what he supports and what he stands for and what he does. You know, I mean, he, he does all of the same things, believes in all the same things when he came, you know, when he was president, massive tax cut, obviously for corporations, lowering the tax rate, you know, all the same things. It's the aesthetic, you know, it's like the decorum. And so it, that's, that's the, the same reason that the liberals hate Trump is the same reason that some of the left hates Jimmy. And what you said, E, I think is so important too, because, you know, the idea that people can change. And if even someone who is as ingrained in their racism or their intolerance as, you know, Klansmen can change, can be persuaded because they humanize and get to know someone who's black. They become friends with that person. It, they, they make that person like an honorary member, you know, of, of basically their, their chapter of the clan, you know, which I like, I remember that video you're talking about, you know, because that's what happened with him. And then a number of them basically renounced the clan. This is also what happened with Fred Hampton when Fred Hampton built alliances with the young patriots. You know, it was a, a, a group of kind of Southern white, you know, uh, Confederate flag celebrating, you know, um, young men uh, in Chicago, you know, that Fred Hampton built alliances with, you know, along with also Latinos in the city, you know, and it was over the same principle. You know, he got, they got them to renounce the Black Panthers and Fred Hampton got them to renounce basically the Confederate flag, you know, and white supremacy, you know, as like, as, as, as beliefs, you know? And so it goes to show that when you can build solidarity as a first thing, as a, as a point of kind of communication, when you approach someone, not kind of like trying to offend all of their, you know, belief, their whole belief system and, you know, their whole kind of cultural worldview, and you instead try to build connection on the things that you agree on that benefit all of us, the need, the, the, the complete lack of, you know, uh, uh, substantial health care in this country, um, the incredible student debt, notwithstanding the drop in the bucket, you know, that the crumbs that Biden gave us, you know, the wars that take two thirds of the budget in this country, the discretionary budget, when you build solidarity over those things, then you can persuade people on other things, which is what the most successful people on the left do, like Jimmy Dore. Can I just make one more point um, really quick? Because then I do want to see the rest of the clip. But that was um, about the whole thing. It, oh, it was? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but but I want to say like one thing, because I know that, um, you know, one thing it seems that a lot of people who who uh, label Jimmy as, as a, a right winger or something like that, you know, they do like to point right to that that interview he did with the Boogaloo Boy, right? They, they love to go to that. And from what I understand, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong, but as far as I know, that Boogaloo Boy that he interviewed had um, provided uh, security at a Black Lives Matter protest, mm -hmm. yes? Okay, so here's my thing about that. One, I think that it's a little difficult to call that guy a racist just, you know, and and dismiss him out of hand. But here's my other point. Let's let's pretend for a second that he actually is a racist. Let let's say that. In his head, he's got racist ideology. But if he still went to that protest and provided security and protection for the people at that protest, do his actions not count more than his thought? He did something moral. He acted in a moral and socially just way. Why does that not count as much as whatever ideology may or may not be in his head? Do, do you guys get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's almost as if you should judge people by their actions as opposed to, you know, whatever you're claiming their belief system is, you know. Exactly. 
you know, all who uh, you're voting for, all you, all who you're voting for, what color you're voting for. That's your morality. Exactly. I'm a patriot. Well, that's political team sports, right? We know exactly, that. exactly. And that game benefits the establishment. That's how they maintain control. That's how Wall Street, the military industrial complex, you know, big pharma, big tech. That's how they maintain control is by getting us to demonize, you know, half the country to an extent you know, where we're not uh, and just write them off so that we never converse with those people, so that we never find points of, of, of unity, of commonality, things that, hey, you know, you also, you know, are having to work two jobs. You also, your health insurance is also a piece of crap, Obamacare, also terrible coverage, you know, and so that you don't have those conversations. Like Jimmy says, it's about, you know, making you hate your neighbor, basically, you know? Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. else that stood out to me is um, look at, look at, I, so I don't know if you can see this, but look at what he's wearing. Look at what the guy who interviewed uh, the Trumper is wearing. So he's wearing a Clark, uh, Clay Clark reopen America tour. All right. So it's like anti, anti mandate shirt. He's also wearing a hat with an American flag, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's not like, immediately trying to like engage in the culture war from like the opposite perspective, you know, and come at him, like drive at him with like the identity politics, you know, like, you know, that that conversation would have never taken place. Instead, he's signaling solidarity to this person. And that's why, you know, he say, okay, look, we agree on the mandates. All right. We agree on the mandate, you know, or, you know, we agree on patriotism. You know, we agree on that. All right. That's a point of discuss, you know, of commonality from which exactly. a conversation can happen, and persuasion can then happen even on other issues, or humanization they, can happen. What they do, though, right, is like you're supposed to take the label, and from that you fill in all the blanks. So, in other words, like we're conditioned to believe, like if X person voted for Trump. Well, I'm there is a list of things then that I'm supposed to assume about that person, right? And right. they may or may not be accurate. Most likely they're not accurate. Um, <laughs> and then um conversely with with somebody who's, you know, on the left or a progressive or like, you know, whatever it is, it's like, okay, well, if you're if you're a progressive or on the left, then you believe XYZ and you've got your list this is a very false narrative. Like people are not that basic. They are way more complicated. Um, and, but that's how we're conditioned so that we don't talk to each other so that it's very easy to demonize everyone, stay in their little lane, take all the working class and you dice them up into all their little groups and let them compete against each other for the crumbs. Right. Yeah. Right. I just want to, um, mentioned something that Karen said. Actually, I was thinking about it and she just sort of synchronized it with my thought. An interest in, um, if people are not basic, but they can be conditioned to basic responses. But uh, uh, a key component of Pavlov's test with his dogs and such was uh, to get the animals to react. Don't think, just react. So when they hear a certain sound or they see a certain light or a combination of the two, right? Or something, they, 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 re, they just react without thinking. And that was the objective of his experiments. And you extrapolate that to people. The, the, the thing about, you know, what I call weaponized identity politics and weaponized uh, intersectionality, in and of themselves, these terms have some value, but once they're weaponized, they're used against the population, right? So you, you hear something or you see something that uh, affects your identity or is pertaining to a certain class or a certain group, and you just react to that. Right? You don't think whether, whether you're left or right or, or wherever you might be. You just, well, we're conditioned. And if you, it's like you're having your, your brain, you know, the cranial lobes of your brain smoothened under the waterfall of the mainstream media, right? It's like standing under, you know, the the, the waterfall of Buffalo, and it's constantly bashing our brains and shooting our brains. The way we just react to animals, right? The, the art is where the more uh, instinctual, like 
the more animalistic tendencies reside. Uh, the more reptilian part, they call it the reptilian brain, and it just reacts. And the information, the media, uh, you know, the, the media such as it is, is conditioned to our emotional center, right? Because we don't have a thinking population, unfortunately. It's not a knowledgeable society. Otherwise, we'd have been in a much better place. So we get people forming at the mouth, you know, eyes bulging, you know, their necks tighter than banjo strings, and all they're ready to do is attack and attack and attack. It, you know, you, you, you lessen the capacity for intelligence, you lessen, you diminish the capacity for communication. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, so when Karen mentioned that, I was like, that's another piece I just wanted to put in there. I totally agree with you. It's very well said. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and, you know, I, I think that like this, this connects, you know, with that conversation about patriotic socialism that's taken place recently, you know, and, you know, the way that he approached him, you know, as a, this, this guy who conducted the interview, he identifies as a communist, you know, that's the whole video is about, and he's talking about very, like, really radical, you know, left ideas, Marxist ideas about, you know, collectivizing, seizing the means of production, you know, uh, uh, abolishing, you know, uh, private corporations, and yet is still able to, you know, form this connection, you know, and I think that part part of that is that it is, you know, what he was signaling. Again, he was signaling on his hat, you know, I have an American flag here, you know, this I'm, I'm identifying, you know, as an American. And I think that, you know, in this conversation, you know, there's been, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of it kind of misses the point. You know, a lot of it is, is in, in effect stay, saying that to have any kind of patriotic sense is to, you know, whitewash or, for, or, or forget or deny or justify like every crime this country's government has committed. You know, and for I don't think that's I don't think those two things are incompatible. I think that you can at the same time recognize the horrific imperialism, colonialism, you know, genocide that this country has perpetrated, you know, against its original inhabitants, against people from around the world, and the incredible hypocrisy of a country that waged a revolution to overthrow an aristocracy and a crown and, a, you know, a, and, and a, uh, uh, you know, a, an old feudal system um, that has then betrayed, you know, that the, the kind of spirit of that revolution. And by that, I'm not talking about most of the founding fathers. I'm talking about Thomas Paine and common sense. That's the spirit of the revolution. Yeah. The, the other founding fathers, you know, the, the, the big landowning, you know, slave owners, you know, the, basically the aristocracy of this country, the elite of this country, they couldn't motivate this country to revolution. It was Thomas Paine who was able to do that with common sense. And so that's the kind of patriotism, I think. And that's the kind of antagonism to oligarchy and to aristocracy that is... I think at the core, that is a tradition of this country that does go back to its founding and which you can take pride in and which you can take pride in the idea of restoring that principle, which was fundamentally anti-imperialist, anti-colonial. What better story to unite this country than to say that the origins of this country, you know, that really motivated the revolution, not the fake bullshit that we're taught, you know, in schools about it, you know, and, and the, the, the fake people that are propped up as supposedly the heroes of that revolution, but rather the Thomas Paine and the common sense that moved this country to overthrow the oligarchs and the aristocracy. What better way, what better story to wage a new revolution in this country than to embody that tradition and that spirit? And that's why I personally don't think that patriotism and socialism or economic populism or leftism are incompatible. Rather, I think it allows us to tell a story about going back 
to that original spirit to overthrow what has since then metastasized into a global capitalist empire, into a system that is crushing the people of this country, that has replaced the aristocrats and the crown of you know, of Great Britain with Jeff Bezos, with uh, Zuckerberg, with Gates, that has replaced them with a billionaire, you know, capitalist class that now imposes wage slavery upon all of the population. I I totally agree with you. And actually, I would offer that um, not only do I think that, you know, uh, something like patriotism and and populism or socialism or you know whatever you want to stick in there um i yes i believe they absolutely can be compatible but i would say even beyond that i think it would be such a tragedy to concede something like patriotism liberty you know the flag whatever to to the the so the you know when i say the right in this case i mean like you know just this um very reactionary bigoted like you know whatever like why would we concede that i don't understand you know i think what the left needs to do is be very clear about what we mean by patriotism right because maybe the knee-jerk reaction when you hear that word um given the circumstances that we currently find ourselves in might be negative um however i think that you know again when you talk about reaching the working class as a whole um one i think if you demonize something like patriotism i don't think you have a shot in hell um i do not see any way that you demonize patriotism the flag just kind of americana as a whole and think you're gonna get a groundswell and and reach the working class i i don't think that's possible but also i would say you know uh if you got a typical person who maybe has like an american flag displayed um you know by their door or whatever i i think that you know that person uh more than likely is not thinking yay military industrial complex and and unjust wars and genocide and colonialism that's not what they're thinking when they display the flag you know it's probably more like the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and freedom and things that they that feel very positive and beautiful to them. But I think the left um, sometimes can get into this bad habit of like, you see that and you're like, oh, God, it's like a horrible, deplorable. No, you you're projecting you don't know what's in their head. Right. So so I think that's um, something to be mindful of. And I'll be honest, too, like for me, that's something I changed my mind about. Like if you had asked me about um, something like, you know, patriotism, even like five years ago, I think I would have given you a different answer because my mindset then was more like, oh God, no, the flag, ew, I can't. I mean, that was a change in myself. And I think that's important that we're always growing and changing and questioning why we believe what we believe. And, um, just the more experiences I had, the more people I met, even being in this party, like I, of course you evolve and I see this very differently now. So I think demonizing patriotism is a, a like a death blow to, to any leftist movement. Yeah. I, I always feel bad for people who uh, have flags in their yard because I mean, you weren't held a lot as a child probably. And I mean, if you don't know where you're at, and every morning you're going to be like, hey, there I am. And where am I again? In America. I got another flag. E, your, your, your flag is fly. But I mean, come on. Like, what? I'm America. Like, what? We're in a neighborhood. Everyone has the same flag. It's just raise something else. Someone should put an Ecuadorian, a Cuban, something just to add some spice. I don't understand. And uh, that's all I we, we have a Red Sox flag, if that helps you. I appreciate that. You should even raid. Well, yeah, I used to hold, I ran a restaurant. I had the flags of the American League East. And, and just like there the pennants, they keep them in order where they are the day. But the American flag, I mean, oh, enough, enough. And I agree. We're not going to get anywhere <laughs> telling all oh, the American flag, let's burn it, let's stamp on it. That, that's been tried. To, like it's, it's more than that. It's, it's a piece of cloth and it's a symbol. All that. Those, those tied arguments and old, <laughs> but whatever. Moving on. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's some good balance. Um, I, I was like Karen uh, not all that long ago. 
um, where I was like, oh, you know, I got, I, I had that instinct to sort of, you know, backslap somebody say uh, patriotism. I got fuck really? patriotism, and I go through the laundry list of what Nick was talking about in terms of colonial destruction and conquest, imperialism, because that's what it's most associated with. Mm -hmm. We don't hear the stories. There was this video I saw years ago of thousands of vets living in the forest and in the woods of Florida and in um, Louisiana, right? Like living in the woods, right? Came back from Iraq, came back from uh, Afghanistan, most of them from the first Iraq war, and they're actually living in the woods. And the guy, um, I think it's Gary Null or somebody, he goes in there with the camera and he's talking to them. And they had, they're using buckets as a bathroom, right? They have to wash their clothes on the lake if they can wash their clothes at all and, and hunting to eat. And this was just a handful of years ago, right? That documentary he did, it was probably like, um, I want to say like maybe 2014 or something. It was not that all that long ago, right? And I see the veterans on the trains begging for money, on the streets begging for money. I mean, at least in Roosevelt's time, they had the, the GI Bill which guaranteed a home, guaranteed services. You know, they, they just removed all of that. And they say, okay, well, you fought for our imperialism for taking oil and whatever from these brown and black people. And they, 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 they treat the veterans like used up paper towels, right? Okay, we're done with you now and just throw them in the trash, right? Uh, in, in terms of um, patriotic uh, socialism, like the way uh, Jackson Hinkle has articulated it, to me, you you can't i don't think it's possible to be a socialist and not love your community right you not love your and and you for me the the family is just a micro of the community right so if you love your family whether they're uh, you know uh, the chosen family like mine like like you guys or your biological family or both then you then you love your community right because the community is just an extension of the of your family and society is an extension it's like a sort of a, 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 a an embiggening of your community right so i don't i don't think that you can actually be a, a socialist or into socialism economic populism economic politics anything where you take the industry of the government and make it work for the people the way it's supposed to you can't do that without some great measure of love inside of you so i don't think those two uh, 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 oppositional at all. People might refer to it as something else. Like I might not say, um, not that I have any problem with the term, I might use another term. Like I might not say patriotic socialism. I might just say uh, economic populism or something and just articulate it from there. But it's the same thing. You, you can't, you know, I, and I'm speaking about me. I should say I can't, you know, keeping it on the eye, as they say, I can't, um, do do work for my community or, or for my family or for people in general if i don't have some level of love for them when i didn't love myself i hated everyone right because i didn't there was no connection between me and them because i hated myself so how, how am i going to love you guys and i hate me it just wasn't it just, it just didn't go together you know so uh, i i think um you, you know people who refer to themselves as uh like jackson hinkle and others I guess that infrared guy, whatever has or whatever, has. listening to them, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great love that they have. They might not say that, but that's that's what motivates you, right? That's what that's what that's what gives you fuel. That's what gives you passion. You have to care about yourself and your family and your community in order to go out there and say, "I'm fighting for this. I'm fighting for that." That's why I got that there because that represents African. American sacrifice towards this and never getting the reward, never getting reparations, never getting 40 acres and a fucking mule, none of that. But that's why I put that there as a reminder that I still have great love, not necessarily for the ideal and what this represents, but for the fact that it, it's, it's all in, to me, and it's going to sound kind of wonky or whatever, but we, we cannot have an egalitarian society where everybody's caring for everybody. And it's like, okay, well, I want human rights and I want protections for me and people I like, right? People who look like me, 
people who I identify with, but screw Karen in, in Massachusetts because, you know, she's a, a, a Trump or whatever, you know, fuck her. She don't get nothing. You, you, you can't, you know, and I'll just say this last piece and, I, and I'll pass it because it's important and I don't want to forget. People are making careers out of these divisions. A lot of these podcasters, a lot of these YouTubers, you know, they, they start off in one position and then they go to the uh, extreme right, you know, even though they, they, are, they call themselves populists or progressives, you know, like all this craziness, what uh, the, the Democratic Party is doing. They're doing all the things they were wanting us Trump was going to do. And people are making lucrative careers, becoming millionaires, sowing this division. Right, a lot of these YouTubers and podcasters, no different from MSNBC, CNN, Fox, and these people. They're just doing it in a in a more contained space, more or less. They don't have the the commercial broadband to do it, but they're doing the same thing, right? So I just wanted to mention that, and we we should look out for that also. I just wanted to um, just to be very clear. I I'm I got what um e what you were saying but just for the record i'm i'm not a trump supporter like i know you know that i just didn't want confusion and i'm not shaming anybody who is i'm just personally not so i just didn't want any confusion on that it was a horrible example no, you know. no i was just like let <laughs> me just you like in my box is directly above me. let me clarify in my box is directly above me so i'm like Pick her. She's right there. Yeah. No, I, and I would have corrected you if you had said the same, you know, Biden hit like I would have corrected you too. <laughs> so. but, but it brings up something that I do. I do love about the People's Party. And that is that we do have so many people who were Trump supporters. Yeah. Um, who've joined us. I mean, it's like now I would say it's as many Trump supporters as it is, you know, people who identify kind of like more on the left. You know, and that to me, that's a real point of pride that shows that we're doing our job because we're showing that people have more in common than they have, you know, that 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 than what separates them and that we are able to have these conversations. And so, you know, I I, I love, you know, in the course of my work, you know, jumping on a, a welcome call, you know, speaking with volunteers, you know, having a one on one, whatever it is, onboarding someone, you know, and you know, and this person saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Trump voter. My whole family was Trump voters, you know, we're all do that. And, you know, and, and yet, you know, we, uh, you know, we followed the people's party's work, you know, we followed your work and, you know, and we think this is, we think this is amazing. We think this is what needs to happen. You know, I, probably one of the things that I'm most proud of is that, you know, um, my brother and he, and, and, and his partner, they're all, uh, his partner's family, they're all uh, uh, his girlfriend's family. They're all um, Trump supporters, you know, all of them. And yet they, they follow us. They watch us. They're, in, you know, enthusiastic about about uh, uh, about the People's Party, you know. And so like that's that's exactly the kind of solidarity that we need, because the Democrats, the Republicans, they have versions of uh, they have versions of, of Hillary's baskets of deplorables. Right. Like the Republicans does it, do they do it too. Remember Mitt Romney saying 47% of Americans are just like, you know, they're just like hopeless, you know? And, you know, you take this, you, you you kind of take this rhetoric to kind of like, it's um it's inevitable conclusion. And that's why it becomes no surprise that like 40% of the country or something thinks that we're going to have a civil war, you know, in this country, because their answer, the more that they consolidate wealth and power, you know, in the oligarchy and the empire, the more they have to exacerbate and dial up hatred of the other side, because the more the working class starts to come together, you know, against them, the more we start seeing through, you know, their ideological barriers and coming together on what we agree on, you know, the more threatened they are. And so that's why you see them really playing, you know, really doubling down on wokeness and the cultural divisions to try to have to, you know, to try to forcibly drive this wedge between working people in this country who are increasingly realizing that we don't have that, you know, what separates us is not, you know, as great as as what unites us. Yeah, it, it just, it, Nick, you, you brought a point. It's taking us to a point of, of hating each other and we're seeing it in our figureheads. Like, remember Trump hugged the flag? 
He just like, so if you love the flag or you love the country, that means if the other people don't. So you're by logically saying, if I love the flag, they don't. Now you have Joe Biden giving speeches in front yes. of, I mean, even if you were on the Death Star, the people in the uh, uh, would have said, listen, Darth, no, we're not going to go with that backing lighting, bro. You're just way too harsh. Let's tone it down a little bit, you know. It, it's frightening. And that's what we're getting to, the yeah. end of, and making everyone our enemy. That's back to the point, the solidarity of us. And we keep coming together mm -hmm. and give outlets to, to each other coming together. Then, and then, and they're going to keep coming at us. And But that's that's okay, because we know when we're together, we we got people, we're going to win. And patriotic, listen, we better start thinking about global patriotism, because we're going to have, we set fires around this world, and people are going to get on this life raft. We have water here. We have resources. We've been prepared. Oh, we need to be getting rid of some of these life rafts. Some of the people in this country are going to have their, their, their country. Part of America is on fire. You know what I mean? It's going to be a part of the They have water. Like this stuff's going to get dicey real quick. And it's not going slow motion. It's going to be. So we need structures. We need a, a, a people's rebellion and a people real voice in politics. What we have to have because. All we have to restart this whole thing over. And I don't think we have the wherewithal to, or the time to do it. I don't think a revolution is. I think we have to work within the government that's set up through the political process. And they're going to stop us at every minute because the two people running, I think it's just fine. You know what I mean? And so we got to keep working together. And solidarity is when we storm the nation and everyone goes like, well, you get five, five million people saying, listen, we want health care now. We're not leaving until you give us health care. And if we could get that and start scaring them, you saw what Occupy Wall Street trickled out right. and, and how much they rallied around. Until and it was building. crushed. Until it was exactly. crushed. <laughs> Until it was attacked because it was a threat. And, and that's where I'll end. Perfect point, yeah. Karen. Yeah. And, you know, it's got to be said, too, that, like, uh, to my knowledge, most of the worker revolutions and the socialist revolutions that have happened around the world and in history, they have had a – they have – repurposed a sense of patriotism you know a sense they have created a, a sense of pride there's a sense of pride in retaking power you know as working people in this country and overthrowing you know this uh this, this just vampire kind of capitalist class you know um that that just leeches off of working people basically you know in this country and in other countries you know and so yeah and and, you know, just before we move on to like, this wouldn't be complete with like, shout out to Caleb Maupin for everything he's done to advance this topic, because that it's, it's really been meaningful, all of his contribution, you know, and so like kudos for all of that. I'm hoping to see him back. He was a champion of this topic. And, you know, politically, I just thought that, I mean, talk about a voice that we need, you know, so I hope he does whatever he needs to do and and comes back in some way, shape or form. Same here. Look forward to him coming back in some way uh, and to his voice, you know, which is very much needed when it comes to these kinds of conversations and these topics. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that we wanted to talk about, the second thing we wanted to talk about was uh, an interview that took place between Crystal Ball and uh, Brianna Joy Gray. Uh, Crystal Ball went on Bad Faith. And it was really a very revealing moment uh, for Crystal Ball, uh, I feel. And so let me bring this up. Uh, because of what she says, I, I feel like she just completely drops the pretense uh, in this interview and just plainly says, you know, we should work with the Democratic Party, the Democratic, there's more chance, you know, for the working class to come to power, to elect a president, uh, in the Democratic Party than in a third party. It's more useful, you know, to keep working in these corporate parties, you know, and that is just amazing. So anyway, with everything that we've seen, so let's watch a little bit of it and then we'll comment on it. ...that there are real electoral consequences at stake here. And I would argue that if it is the fear that you might lose, if it is the fear that midterms are going to be an even bigger bloodbath, if it's electoral consequences that are ultimately moving Biden's hand, it's not clear to me that it makes sense to say that a third party candidate with the power to, yes, have the spoiler effect isn't exactly what's necessary mm -hmm. to get the best outcome, especially when you're talking about you're, you're weighing you're weighing the pressure of a third party campaign and getting Biden to come to the table and do what he needs to do against an insider run for presidency, which I would love to be effective, but we've now seen Bernie Sanders, a 
but a naturally capable candidate, better positioned than almost anyone I can imagine. Certainly anybody else that I could be thinking of right now in this historical moment, still trying, beating out everybody in fun fundraising and losing. And I, I, I really take the point that there is a certain impossibility to the idea of running as an outsider, but only if you think of the only gain being getting into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If you think, well, leverage, but let me say, let me okay, I think we got a comment on it a little bit already because she made, um, Brie made a really important point already. And that is that you don't have to necessarily win in order for it to be a victory when you run as a third party candidate. You know, just running, just the fact that you are running, you are building an independent party. The fact that you can use that opportunity to organize, that you can give a different home to unions like um, unions, you know, the new unions at Starbucks, and Amazon, other, you know, uh, Apple, other unions that are rising, that you can use it to as a chance to, you know, create kind of like a focal point for a working class uh, 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 kind of resistance and fight back against the establishment that you can use it to organize direct actions, you know, to get people onto the streets. You can do this through a presidential campaign and you can do this through an independent third party presidential campaign a hell of a lot more effectively than you can in, in, in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Anybody want to comment on that? No, I I mean, I understand that point completely. And I, I agree with it. And I think that, you know, um, anything outside of what is sort of the accepted structure, which is just right, like the two parties, um, if it can cause some kind of significant political shakeup, um, that makes the establishment nervous and something can come from that. That can be the catalyst that then causes something else and really creates an opening, right? So I think there is value in that. And and I'm waiting because I'm assuming that that Crystal is going to, to uh, not see it that way. <laughs> yeah, there's more, let's listen to it. Let me say though, even on this, uh... Student, just if we focus on student debt, why did Biden take that position in the primary? It's because he was going to lose the primary if he didn't. I mean, that's where the pressure came from that forced him into that position is the fact that you have Bernie Sanders having run in 2016 and Bernie Sanders having run in 2020 and in the Democratic primary, forcing this issue on the table and forcing him to take a position that he doesn't want to take. So even in that example of the student loan debt relief, it mattered to be on that stage, pressuring him directly. Joe Biden didn't care what Jill Stein or um, you know the Green Party was saying. He was forced into that position because of what was happening in the Democratic primary. You know, there, it's an interesting question whether or not Bernie Sanders, had he gone rogue in 2016 or gone rogue in 2020, whether he would have had a greater or lesser effect. And I think that before Bernie lost in 2020, the argument- All right, I have to say there too. I personally tried to persuade Bernie to do that, you know, and he should have done. And a lot of people, a lot of other people, Cornell tried to persuade Bernie to do that. Cornell West, uh, Chris Hedges, Shama Sawant, you know, he wasn't willing to do that because, you know, as he, of course, said, he, he didn't want to become another Ralph Nader, you know. But frankly, I think being Ralph Nader is something to be extremely proud of. Um, to have done, you know, the damage that he did to the to the two party system. And I think we need to actually, um, as Bree is arguing here, we need to embrace the idea that we're, quote unquote, spoilers. You know, you're spoiling our lives. You know, we need. Yes, we have power. There is power in the idea that we can get a, that that it can be attributed to us, whether it's true or not, that we threw an election. That's exactly, if, if there are no consequences, as Brie argues here, then there's no reason to want to support any kind of left policies. I mean, I think the greatest illustration of this and one of Bernie's biggest mistakes, you know, and I worked on his campaign, I lobbied the superdelegates on his 2016 campaign as a national political outreach coordinator on that campaign. One of his biggest mistakes is that from the onset, 
he told the DNC and Hillary Clinton that if I lose the primary, I'm going to support the establishment. I'm going to support, I'm going to endorse the corporate candidate, Hillary Clinton. So what incentive did that create? It created an incentive for them to cheat him. And of course they did that because they thought, oh, this is great. Now we can steal the primary from you. And then you're going to support us as opposed to running as a third party candidate or running independent. Guess what Trump did in the same situation? When the RNC was threatening that they were going to rig the primary, Trump did the opposite. He said, if you clowns rig the primary process against me, I'm going to run independent. I'm going to run third party against you. And guess what happened? They didn't rig it because he actually had leverage. There was a threat there. And he used that threat. He Trump has used the threat of creating or running as a third party candidate very effectively. When they tried to impeach him the second time and, you know, around Biden's inauguration, they tried to impeach him in order to make him ineligible, disqualify him from running in 2024. And then they tried to censure him when they couldn't impeach him. It was all about preventing him from running in 2024 because they already knew even then that the Democrats cannot beat Trump. And that's become all the more obvious since then. Hence, all the efforts to basically erase him, disqualify him from running again. All right. What did Trump do when they tried to impeach him for to prevent him from running in 2024? He threatened to form a third party, the Patriot Party. That's where you have power. He exerted that power. Guess who never does that? The squad, Bernie Sanders, the people in the Democratic Party that are supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, on our side. They never do that. Because they don't want to. Because they're fundamentally not with us. That's what I'm saying. They don't want to. Yeah, they could. The, um, Trump was uncontrollable. And he mm -hmm. thought this is a vanity project. He's not trying to lift anybody but himself. But that mm -hmm. dog determination to bring everybody with you, it, he played games because it's a it's a it's a corrupt situation. We see, all see it. The fleas are out there. I mean, you can see. I just it's it's so corrupt. It, all I see is when I hear these conversations about reforming the Democratic Party from within or any of that is that Mario Silva speech is when the machine becomes so odious that you have to throw your bodies on these gears. We have to destroy this. So I don't care who wins the Republican or the Democrat. I don't care. I don't even care. I am pushing third party. Like I've said, if if a the squirrel nut zipper fans come in, a Democrat or Republican, I'm with the squirrel nut zipper people. That's me, and I'm and I'm and I don't care. And we're all, we, there's more people like that, and we're gonna be told like, oh, it's insense, it's not sensible, or you're throwing your vote away. Bullshit. The votes are being thrown away. They're being funneled into two parties, one party really funneled in that. So I don't care. So that's dead. And we know how we know how venal and gross these people are. They play they play political football with women's autonomy uh, over their body. I mean, they have no shame either side. They even think that Roe v. Wade should have been like set a lot. So the rest of the world is we, we're clowns. We're clowns just in our own bubble, hearing our own voices, telling our red and the blue, or like all that. We're just clowns. We we have no context of what the world's going through. It's coming. It's coming like a freight train because they can't control it. And this winter is going to be tough with the lack of heating oh, yeah. around the world, with all this money being spent to some frigging country that most people couldn't even find on a map and don't even give a. I, 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 I'm ranting. I'm sorry, but just I, this is you can't reform the Democratic Party. That's done. That's a, it's a novel. And the only thing Crystal Ball is doing is here is is trying to like this is where her this is where her street cred is. I can get the in like the young independent people who aren't Clintonites, but you know maybe Pete Buttigieg. That's who. That's what Crystal's trying to get. Crystal Ball's trying to get Pete Buttigieg. Oh, maybe come on, come on. It's not that bad. Or some. De like I don't know, some one of the squad, one of the frauds, bring them up, all oh, pat them up, and now they're the person. Now, if you vote against them, either you're anti-black, anti-gay, anti-young, anti-this, anti-whatever, anti-democracy. That's another thing being thrown out. Now we're voting for democracy. I mean, I don't even how. If you're voting, that's democratic. So you can't vote against democracy. Okay, kids can't. It's in the phrase. Sorry, you lose. <laughs> Rant ended. Sorry. <laughs> So they, they they actually get into let me keep playing it because they get into the candidates that they're kind of like you know thinking about um so don't, let me bring it back up and that it that is also that is also very uh revealing all right here we go 
agreements against third parties and people operating outside of the Democratic Party were a lot stronger. In a world where we had such a capable candidate that still was derailed, all of the kind of like, I'm a, you know, I'm, this is the serious person's way to do it kind of arguments, all of the, you know, you, you just got to do it within the Democratic Party arguments, they lost a lot of teeth as far as I'm concerned. You have to be able to show, I mean, and look, I, I adore Marianne, you know, but it is going to be, it is, it is almost as difficult to imagine a, a real victory there in the same way as it is to difficult to imagine a victory by any of the third party candidates that I've admired and voted for. See, I, I don't agree. Or with even that a Bernie 2016. Tell me why. I don't agree with that at all because it, I mean, we have the historical record, like Bernie came very close twice. We don't have a third party. No, he did not. He did not. They will, they will go to whatever they will allow you to think that you have a chance and let you go right up to the line, but it's rigged from the beginning. This is what I learned working on his campaign. This is what so many people have learned from both of the camp from both of his campaigns now. They they let you have the illusion that it's possible because it serves them for you to have the illusion that it's possible. Campaign very close in modern history. So, I mean, Ross Perot was the best example. And, you know, even since that time, sort of things have changed. And also he was like, you know, fairly like in a lot of ways, corporate friendly It's a different situation. But um, we have the record of Bernie coming quite close. And I'm not interested in like raising an issue awareness or I, I shouldn't say that. I am interested in the idea of raising awareness around issues. I'm more interested in actually winning the presidency and the powers that that entails, because we do see that when even a Joe Biden decides he wants to move, there's tremendous powers in that office. We saw that also with, you know, Trump, who we got lucky was like too incompetent to actually really wield the power. But if you look at the work, for example, I think David Dayan does the best work on this over at the American Prospect of all of the actions, the executive orders that forgetting Congress, the president could take to help provide people with, you know, drug yeah. pricing relief and in which he doesn't do <laughs> and all of those things to me that's it's really important that we try to actually get someone in the white house so that we're not just like pressuring around the edges on this issue and that issue and settling for half a loaf like we are right now with student loan debt relief so i take the point that you know maybe like maybe there's a third party route to pressure on one particular area or the other although frankly i think that that has mostly come from grassroots organizers and within the Democratic primary context. But if your goal is to win the White House, I just don't think that I don't think that the obstacles are comparable. I fully acknowledge there are a million obstacles within the Democratic Party. They don't want you to succeed. It's very difficult. They will try to ring it against you like they did to Bernie in 2016. All of that is 100 percent true. Third party in American political context, given the way that our voting system is right now, it's just not set up to succeed yeah it's not can you stop it for a second oh because, yes please so like a couple of things first, first of all first of all somebody just get crystal like a pumpkin spice latte because that's the only thing missing um i just want to see her likes it because the transformation is complete um but beyond that she's literally sitting there acknowledging how corrupt the democratic party is she's like oh my god they're gonna they're gonna rig it they're gonna they're gonna you know do whatever they can to to crush you they might kill you like we just don't know vote for them anyway like you should really go this route to affect like that is so um illogical that is so idiotic and then the other point is that so right like everything she's saying is like oh don't you realize then that like, because they will always crush third parties, um, yes, that's how they're able to then turn around and say, see, see, third parties don't work. They can't win. Yeah, because you crush them every time. So she's, she's explaining to you all the corruption. She's laying it out. And they're like, but this is that guys, 
this is the route that this is the route of the revolution right here is the democratic party because look what we got we got um you know a, a non-student debt relief we we got a non-victory that like liberals were wetting themselves over like that's what we got you know she starts the clip with the uh, telling how close bernie came to winning this thing and then ends the clip or ends that cut by just saying how they're going to start had no chance he was cheated like right it, it, you can't have you it doesn't the circle doesn't meet you don't have an opportunity to win and then they, they're going to not let you win you just said they're not going to let you win you could never win but bernie came close so it's never going to happen and and she's just trying to sell her and kyle or whatever type of youtube they're just it's a brand That's for it. her yeah. I think at this point, it's yeah. it's a brand the same way that like AOC is a brand, you know, it, it's it like sell their little progressive merch and, you know, hashtag, you know, resistance manicure or whatever it was. Um, so that that that's an embarrassing clip. It's uh, it's also um, cognitive dissonance. You know what Buzzy was talking about, where um, people double down on something that's factually incorrect mm -hmm. and the narrative becomes reality and no matter how much you you present them with facts or, or re, you know the truth whatever it might be because they because of their identity affiliation in terms of their politics and their ideology they double down triple quadruple quintuple down you know all these on, on all these different metrics uh, because they they want to believe the thing and because they they hate you for no specific reason or for a specific reason they they want to they won't even accept uh, any any form of truth or reality right they just be like okay i hate these people i hate this person and this is what i was referring to about people making lucrative careers on division right even even with uh with crystal ball and i remember seeing a passage of her book on Twitter, where she's like praising Biden, right? I never read a book. I don't know if you know, but there's a page somebody in there took and they they took a picture, put it on Twitter, and she's she's in there and you know Biden is the best thing since sliced bread, right? A, a, a war criminal, you know, a, a, you know all all kinds of depraved stuff is coming out about Biden and his daughter, and we have years of him sniffing sniffing on kids his son you know the most celebrated crackhead in the world <laughs> uh you know with, with bio labs and, and all this crazy shit with the pentagon going going on so this is a this is a crime family in no in no yeah. small regard and they celebrate you know and and the people that's uh that's pulling these careers you know like like crystal and all these other people they're they're they're, they're making lucrative careers on this division because right? they feed in into that Pavlovian reactionary instinct. But okay, I'm gonna give you more reasons, you know, to basically be a, a hateful idiot. And I'm gonna get paid because you're gonna subscribe. And that's that's you know, it's pathetic. And Is funny that the, the conversation about they, they the Democrats, I don't want to get in this Democrat, Republican, what they're doing for these midterms and all that, because it's like comment, commentating on professional wrestling. I don't care how Kogan versus Sergeant Slaughter, but the Democrats are, are scared. They know Bernie could rally their base and they get some energy out of him. How they corral that energy is now, they the first year we caught him a little bit by, but Dick, you knew, like he knew, he, he, I'm gonna sign a loyalty oath. I could never break this. I'm coming back, You, I'm bringing everybody there. So the sheep herding thing in, in, in 2020 was a little different when he just got slammed, but they knew they were never gonna let him have it. It was said in court, it's a private company, the DNC, we will pick who the winner is. You have no real choice. It's the illusion of democracy. My my point being here is that there's just the, I, I I'm sorry I lost my train of thought. It's just it's mind numbing when you start talking about like what are they going to do? Who are they going to run? Because they know when you start polling Buttigieg and Camilla that they 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 poll with bile and and dog vomit. Like and they have no new answer. And their number one answer is vilifying Trump, who, who's a piece of shit but they're scared of him because he brings people together gets people to rallies he gets people fired up they don't have anybody and if bernie comes out again it's it's gonna it's not gonna be the same it'll be less because he's compromised and, and he just sold us joe biden you know what i mean he told us it's my buddy biden and he's done nothing except make these scary videos 
and and clap and pat people and shake people's hands who aren't there. I mean, it, it, it's it's the, the farce of the United States is is on display right now. How comical we must look to the world, just how we're presenting ourselves. I mean, ironic. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, I, I was gonna say that ironically, Bernie is the greatest example of why the Democratic Party cannot be reformed. Hmm. Okay, because weeks I was I was there at our revolution and I helped Bernie start our revolution weeks after the 2016 campaign and ended. Okay, and that campaign was totally different from the 2020 campaign. You know, then he was running against the oligarchy. He was bringing together, you know, people from the left and the right. He was really running as an economic populist. You know, in 20 by 2020, you know, the Democratic machine had co-opted him and he had lost his appeal among rural voters, among, you know, a, a lot of young people. You know, he's like, you know, that that kind of groundbreaking, you know, coalition that he brought together, working class coalition fell fell apart, you know, because they could because they made him they turned him from an independent, a real independent in a populist, you know, to a Democrat and everything that that stands for. But Bernie Sanders, weeks after the 2016 campaign ended, agreed to taking billionaire money, including from some of the very same billionaires that had been funding the uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. Okay. Every single piece of merchandise, every single email he ever sent to his supporters was signed, paid for by Bernie Sanders, not the billionaires. All right. Now, if the, if a machine, if a political machine, the democratic party can be so powerful that it can get this man who just, you know, who's been an independent for 30 years in Congress, just that ran this revolutionary campaign to do that to betray his principles in that way, then there's no hope for reforming that party. If that's the best that exists in the Democratic Party, if that's the most that's capable, Bernie Sanders, who weeks after the campaign ended, was also making deals, striking deals with Chuck Schumer to support Chuck Schumer offering him head of the budget committee in 2016, if Bernie Sanders supported some corporate senators, these five corporate senators that Chuck Schumer wanted him to support. Bernie Sanders had just run against everything that represents. And he, and yet he took that deal from Schumer. At the same time, he agreed to take that big money at our revolution. So if that's the best it has to offer, there's no reforming it. The other thing I want to say is that Crystal is obviously not aware of this. The Democratic Party, she clearly doesn't understand, you know, and I've been there, I get it. The Democratic Party is a private corporation. These are their own words in court, all right? And founding a party also, I understand this, we understand this. This article, the DNC argued and their lawyer argued that as a private corporation, they have no obligation to follow their own primary rules. They literally argued in court when they were they were sued by Elizabeth and Jared and Jared Beck in the DNC lawsuit. And they their argument was not that we didn't rig the 2016 election against Bernie Sanders. It was that we have the right to rig the election. It was that it is the election is basically a, a show. And in effect, we in reality, we're choosing the nominees. So everybody knows one, whether it takes one route, whether it's a super delegate coup, whether it is, you know, Obama uniting the candidates, whatever they have to do, whether it is the nuclear option of disqual, they had a nuclear option against Bernie. No matter what, even if he was winning, they were going to disqualify him. They were going to say that he wasn't, in fact, a legitimate Democrat, which is required. You have to be under the DNC rules, a Democrat to run within their primary. You know, he's an independent in uh, in Vermont, and they were going to disqualify him in that way. He has a deal with the uh, with the state party in Vermont, the state Democratic Party, which allows him basically to run on that ballot line and they don't challenge him. But the DNC doesn't have to recognize that. So they had a nuclear option. They could have actually sabotaged his campaign if they wanted to at any moment. They are never, 
ever going to allow a progressive or someone on the left to win in that party because it is not, it's against their own interest. The people who run that party, it's against their interest. The people who run that party are corporate consultants. They are lobbyists. Those people lose their access and their position if someone on the left was to come to power. So you might think within their party, so you might think that, oh, well, of course it's in the Democratic Party's interest to have someone like Bernie Sanders win, you know, win if it means that they can win the general election. No, because the people who are in control of the party, the DNC members, they actually lose because they benefit when they are in power themselves when they are able to continue raising that corporate cash and heck even when they're able to to raise millions upon millions upon millions of dollars by demonizing someone like donald trump that's an excellent point i was just about to get into it uh, and i could tell you're still traumatized from your experience <laughs> but, um, you know it's still a, still a, a lot of emotional anchors there and uh that can do that can do a psychological damage because you know we we invest, especially when you're as close to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the factory as possible, to see how everything, how the sausage is made, the closer you are to the, to the machines. You invest so much emotional, mental, and even spiritual energy, right? Physical energy into this thing that you fully committed it and fully believe in. And then when the betrayal becomes unmistakable, you know, it just it, it crushes you, right? It, uh, it really, really breaks your heart and it can break you. It can break your soul. Uh, what I wanted to mention um, that you you spoke on, and I'm just looking at it here, a, uh, a, a counterpunch article from 2015 uh, written by Paul Street that gets into how starting from 1990, right, when he, when he lost his, uh, his congressional race there, from 1990, he went and made a deal with the Vermont Democrats. Started all the way back then. So he had already bent the knee. I mean, all throughout the 80s, I guess he was like a a socialist and, you know, anti-establishment, anti-imperialist. But as soon as he lost that congressional race, he knew which side his bread was butter, his side was buttered on. So for him, in his mind, you know, knowing knowing all of that, having all that history already, he, 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 it was baked in, it was already baked in to fail on both times, right? It was already it was already baked in and the millions of people, but the the benefit out of it is that, you know, people like yourself and, and others who worked on that campaign saw that there's a real hunger out there for it. Right? Like um, I think it was Buzzy that mentioned Occupy Wall Street. I've been down there many times. I, I didn't sleep in the shanty towns of uh, Zuccotti Park. However, what I realized right away is that the people that set up the whole concept, the, the ones that went down there first and were holding up signs talking about Occupy Wall Street, they were all performance artists, right? They weren't activists. They weren't uh, politicians or on the progressive. They, these, these, were, these were resistance artists. And the main idea they have, if you ever saw the, um, the poster, was the ballet on the bull, right? It, it was just like performance art. And when and when Obama shitted on 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 the people and gave twenty nine trillion or more thirty trillion to the banks, the zombie bankers, hedge fund hyenas, wild dogs of derivatives, and these other parasites and ghouls from Wall Street, and and you know shitted on the homeowners, many of them physically traveled because I spoke to them. Many of them physically traveled from Ohio, Texas, many of these places where they had their homes taken from them. They went to Occupy Wall Street. And then the people that were doing all the performance art are uh, ad busters from uh, Vancouver, right? Once they saw people actually saying, look, like, like look, I have nothing else in my life, right? Nothing else is going on. You know, I got shitted on. I, I was trying to make my payments. I got into this scheme with this bank. They bailed out the bank and, and put me and my family out. Right? About 8 million people that happened to, 5.1 million families, something like that. And these people traveled, many of them, by the thousands, to New York, to down there in Wall Street. And I used to go down there. And then they sent um, the anthropologist, Graeber, uh, David Graeber. 
and he was the one that that was that came up with all these phrases about um, demands are bad. You can't have no demands. If you're demanding anything from the system, you're just like the system. So power is bad. You don't want power. We just want to make our voices loud enough so they can hear us in their golden towers, right? And once they started bringing this guy around, and I, and I listened to his uh to his gaslighting, his brainwashing. I listened to his sessions. Like I actually stood a few feet from him, and he would tell people to change signs, right? And when they had the people mic and unions, like union union leaders started coming there, they would chase them away. They'd be like, listen, you know, we don't want your leadership. We don't want your experience. We don't want your unity. We don't want any of that. We just want to do this people mic thing and you can go, you know, go back to your union. So it 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 was from the beginning, from what I saw, it, it was never because they got scared when all those people started coming down. And of course, what, what did they do? They turned it into a grift. They put some servers down there and they got a couple people, to, they got many people to donate from around the world. So they made a couple million dollars. And then when uh, Bloomberg came with the, with the uh, Department of Sanitation and they started sweeping all the, all the people's books and, and, and pets and, and um, you know, they, they just destroyed everything, right? And he got the okay from Obama to do it. We know that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's so I was there in Occupy Wall Street, and that was that was structurally meant to fail. The same thing like Bernie Sanders, right? Yeah. And Black Lives Matter came down there, and they were like, "Oh, you know, all these black people coming here because more people got shot under Obama, more black people got shot and killed by the by the by the pig cops than under Bush, right? First black president. So they came to Occupy Wall Street too, and I interacted with many of them." And many of them couldn't get on the people's mic because they were too radical. So yeah, I, 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 I know you could see the similarity in these things, the 99 flavors of the Democratic Party, whether they call themselves Occupy Democrats, um, Our Revolution, now it's uh, what, pr pr pragmatic progressives, whatever that <laughs> shit is. The Which 99 the term. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's like the 99 flavors of Al Qaeda I mean, of, of the Taliban, you got the 99 flavors of the Democratic Party, and we're not that. And that's why I'm part of this. Yeah. Um, well, guys, I just want to say, like, this has been amazing. I'm actually going to have to jump off in just a minute. I have to get up early tomorrow. Um, but thank you very much for having me. I thought this was an amazing discussion. It was an honor to to be in your company. Um, I think you're all brilliant. So I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Oh, um, my condolences to, to Dozer. I didn't tell you before. Oh, but, uh, they, my condolences yes, to Dozer. No, thank you. Um, I, yeah, um, I, uh, my my fiance and I, we, uh, we lost our beloved uh, Greyhound um, on Saturday, very unexpectedly um, from heart failure. And um, I want to tear up, but thank you, E. Yeah, I'm trying like day by day. Um, but this was this was great, guys. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank yeah. You. In fact, you know, we've uh, uh, I think we've covered all the different topics that we had. So I think it's a great. <laughs> oh, is that okay? I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure. We were at the end. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, that you know. Last thing I wanted to point out is that just uh, is that. It you know what was really missing from this conversation from Crystal and Brianna was Jimmy Dore. Where the fuck is Jimmy Dore? Like, why you're talking about Marianne Williamson? You know, you're talking about Nina Turner as a potential candidate, mm -hmm. but Jimmy Dore has received a hell of a lot more attention. Dore twenty four, baby, for his potential run in twenty twenty four, and he's already basically touring the country, bringing out hundreds of people everywhere he goes at his shows. For he years. brings together left and right. Ev you know, everywhere that like, you, just you know, answered he, your own question. You just answered your own question about why wasn't he there? You just gave yourself the answer. I think this is like a version of Jimmy Dore derange, like of Trump derangement syndrome. There's like the, the Jimmy Dore derangement syndrome. And there's like the strain where, you know, you're like a Sam Cedar or you're like a Chenk Uger and you can't, you know, <laughs> stop talking about him. And then there's like the strain where you're like, you know, Crystal Ball or Kyle Kalinske or even Brianna Joy Gray, where it's like you can't 
actually bring him up <laughs> in a yeah. conversation that is like where it's yeah. like directly he, he trans related for doing nothing. to him. No. He, he just trends for breathing. He just it, these days he just trends just for existing. It, no, but it it kills them. It kills them. And also like any time that I've you know seen um on Twitter or something where somebody will will challenge the claim like okay you're you know x person like you're saying that jimmy door is a right winger like please point out like like what like get, give me the list give me a thing they don't have anything and like i like i mentioned earlier i think that when they do um they'll reference the boogaloo boy but again you're really leaving out a whole lot of context around that because it's inconvenient and people have their their knee-jerk reactions right we label this as this, we label this as this, we label this person as this thing. Like, so that's what happens. There's no critical thinking whatsoever. Um, we're in these very careful lanes. And I think that a lot of the things that Jimmy says, if someone that was more of the like accepted left was saying it, they'd be totally fine. They'd be totally mm. fine. Um, so it's the personality, exactly. it's the verbato, it's the optics, exactly. it's all of that. Exactly. And that's why, that's what I was saying earlier is that uh, the leftist, like this, like brand of leftism that is like, you know, Democratic Party adjacent that, or just like unabashedly Democratic, like Crystal Ball, you know, Kyle Kalinske, that, um, you know, the, the, the reason they don't like Jimmy is his aesthetic. You know, is he's too good at appealing to the right, not because he not because of what he actually stands for, because of what he believes. And that's the same thing that the liberals don't like about Trump. It's like ultimately, you know, his de it, he doesn't have the decorum. He doesn't have the right, you know, the 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 right, you know, way of the conducting himself, you know, like. Yeah, you know, that, the, the that's the decorum what really while, while people are, are, are dying, still yeah. dying from covid. Still, you know, because dying Trump and Biden, yeah, like they're eerily similar in like what they do. And in fact, like I believe Obama deported more people than Trump, but we paint Trump yeah. as anti-immigrant and and Obama as some kind of like savior to the left. Like this doesn't make any yeah. sense whatsoever. It, one of the things, just the Democrats, it's, it's not bad enough they're sadist enough that they would stop any popular uprising to bring health care to people. They also promote the most twisted Republicans. They send money to promote these. And then when these people get win, they're confused. And, and that's that's the game they're playing. That's how twisted that machine is, the DNC. And the RNC is right there with them. They mm -hmm. serve their masses. They're dead to all of us. And uh, speak. I'm kind of dead too. Like I said, I got to get out of here too. Nick, uh, <laughs> Nick, thank Nick, you, Nick, Nick. Great job hosting, Nick. I want to thank Nick. Great job with all the aesthetics and, and handling oh, yeah. the whole thing. And I, I really appreciate that. And E, great points, Karen. Always salty and fiery at the same time. Love it. Yeah, I just want to mention something. Um, that that that's something Nick mentioned before about um about how damn I even I just I just lost my point. You had mentioned it. Uh, buzzy, but it, it was something. I guess my brain is is collapsing on me too, because <laughs> I've been to like two meetings today. Um, All right, <laughs> we'll br we'll bring it up, Buzzy, in our chats uh, when it, when it, I mean uh, E when it comes back to you. Um, All right, all. It's been a great conversation, and uh, we'll be back next week as a, as the People's Podcast. And so uh, you can see the podcast on uh, you know go to YouTube. Subscribe there, share it on social media, and we will see you uh, next week. Yeah. All right, all. Great conversation. Bye.